20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. When I finally got the chance to go see this rocket festival myself, I leapt at the chance. I love learning about how these kinds of things work. And I also love the dangerously negligent madness of the whole thing. Anytime you can release incredible amounts of uncontrolled energy in the middle of a crowd and have everyone screaming with joy, I'm in. That's my kind of thing. When I first saw one of these rockets, it was in a YouTube video I saw a couple of years back. And I was really impressed. I mean, it's beautiful, it's majestic, and technically it works super well. It launches, it flies way up in the sky to Apogee, the parachute pops out, and it gently floats back to Earth. And I thought, they gotta have some really serious tech on board that's managing all this stuff. And the truth is, it's incredibly simple. So let's take a deep dive and learn exactly how these majestic rockets actually work. The propulsion system for these rockets basically consists of steel pipes packed with gunpowder. As crazy as that sounds, that's about it. The smaller rockets, which are still about three meters in diameter, use four inch pipe. This pipe holds about 21 kilograms of gunpowder. The monster six meter rockets use six inch pipe. These can hold up to about 110 kilograms of gunpowder. The propellant powder itself is made out of potassium nitrate, charcoal made from the acacia tree, and sulfur. It's not just your average ordinary gunpowder though. It's specially formulated to burn slowly and not explode. At least we hope. They mix up three different blends with three different burn rates, fast, medium, and slow. These powder mixtures are carefully packed into the steel tubes using a hydraulic press, very much like a layer cake. The stacking of the layers is carefully done to coincide with the physical positions of the rocket nozzles. This provides the right thrust profile to keep the whole thing working correctly. The rocket nozzles themselves are just 20 millimeter holes bored into the side of the steel pipe. Small plates of steel are welded onto the pipes where the nozzles are to be drilled. These prevent the burning gases from eroding and enlarging the hole prematurely. The three meter rockets have four nozzles while the six meter have six. The rocket nozzles on the outer edge are angled slightly to produce torque that makes the rocket spin. The slowest burning propellant is positioned to coincide with the rocket nozzles. This allows you time to run away when the things get ignited. It also allows the rocket to spin up before the real thrust kicks in. So when it does finally hit lift off thrust, it's spinning at the correct speed. The thrust output of the engine should therefore increase as the thing starts to take off with the fastest burning and most violent propellant happening when it's way up in the air, well out of harm's way. The ends of this rocket fuel stack are capped off with plugs of clay, followed up by big hardwood plugs with a giant cross bolt that holds them in position. 
Some builders form a crimp seal around the end of the wooden plug by peening the steel over at the very end. This gives it an extra added bit of security. For a successful launch, it's really important that the powder at all the nozzle locations gets ignited simultaneously. In preparation for flight, the rocket nozzles, which are clogged with propellant powder, get cleaned out. We drill down and then replace the powder with a fresh mixture. A small mound of propellant is formed around the outside of the rocket nozzle. The propellant is then covered up with a fluffy mound of stuffing from an old pillow that has been thoroughly laced with gunpowder and potassium nitrate. This little wad gets tightly wired on over the hole to prevent any of the powder from leaking out. This configuration creates a large and highly flammable touch point for easy ignition. The rockets are basically gyro stabilized. The spinning mass acts as a giant gyroscope which tends to keep the rocket in plane. As long as that plane is pointing up, you're in pretty good shape. The slow burning powder mixture that's located near the nozzles initially doesn't create enough thrust for liftoff, but does impart rotation. Once the fast burning powder mixture starts to burn, it produces enough thrust to cause liftoff. By then, it should be rotating at a high enough angular velocity to stabilize it throughout the rest of its flight. The design goals of the structure are to concentrate a reasonable amount of mass at the largest possible radius from the center, while still providing a minimum amount of aerodynamic drag in the direction of travel. It's all a compromise. We need to create a large enough moment of inertia for the gyro stabilization to work, but not make it so heavy that it doesn't want to fly. The bamboo hoop structure accomplishes this admirably. It's really stiff and strong, but it's also lightweight so it doesn't weigh the rocket down. The critical joint between the engine and the frame is accomplished by wrapping thin sheet metal around the whole hoop structure and then nailing it into the wooden plugs at the end of the engine. Beer bottle caps are utilized as high performance washers that help to spread the load and clamp the bamboo hoops in position. The recovery of the rocket is accomplished with a standard parachute system. The goal of the flights is maximum time aloft, so the parachutes are relatively oversized for the weight of the rockets. They are made out of ripstop nylon, usually in dark colors that are easy to see against the sky. The parachutes are carefully positioned on top of the rocket, exactly at the center of mass. They're held in position by plastic strapping that wraps around the steel tube of the rocket motor. As the rocket nears apogee, the steel tube becomes nearly red hot and simply melts through the plastic strapping releasing the parachute. Once released, the centrifugal forces of the rotating rocket cause the parachute to be flung radially outward where it is clear to inflate in the fast moving airstream. Since the nylon parachute is effectively strapped to a steel tube that gets red hot, it's extremely critical that a heat shield be employed between the parachute and the rocket motor. They have an extremely elegant and clever solution to this problem. The skin of a banana tree. This material has a very thick and fibrous structure, very much like cardboard, and within the corrugations is probably about 80 to 90 percent water. I believe this material acts almost like an active cooling system. As the water boils away, it removes a tremendous amount of thermal energy. And once the water is exhausted, the fiber structure probably has a very high thermal resistance. All of this serves to completely protect the parachute from melting. Additional layers of both dried and green plant leaves are employed to protect the parachute from the blast of liftoff. The basic design of these rockets is strictly adhered to by tradition, but makers do make tiny incremental changes to the design. The competitive nature of the event does produce an incentive to converge on an optimal design. It's an evolution. Both cultural and economic limitations enforce elegant simplicity. Techno feature creep is not evident. 
There's no reward for escalation of complexity, as tradition is honored over arbitrary advances in performance. Readily available materials are always preferred, and sometimes to great effect. Imagine if NASA was faced with that heat shield problem. A banana skin is the last thing they would ever use. Their solution would cost a million dollars and probably take a year to develop. It would be amazing, but a banana skin would still beat it by 100 million to one in a cost-benefit analysis. As we have all seen the amazing advances of SpaceX, a degree of risk tolerance is beneficial to progress. We can all see in retrospect how the Russian space program advanced rapidly in the early days of the space race. They blew up a lot of rockets but learned quickly from their mistakes. The NASA of the space shuttle era became risk adverse. They tried to normalize the inherently dangerous activity of spaceflight. By attempting to downplay these inherent risks, a bureaucratic culture developed that discouraged the open discussion of risk, which doomed the space shuttle program entirely. Nothing to see here, it's all perfectly safe. In a funny way, I see this Thai rocket festival as a parable about the risks of space flight and technology in general. On one hand, if you're super sketchy, you're gonna get hurt. But the absolute avoidance of risk also leads you to a very dark place. It's a continuum, and you always have to see where you are along that line. The middle is probably the place you want to be. Well, I hope you all enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. My current subscriber level is 8,500, and I constantly see comments on my videos that say it should be much, much more. So help make that actually happen. Click the like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Help me juice this up. Thanks again so much.